Hi, everyone. Bob Jennings here with you today, along with Todd McCracken from NSBA. Todd, welcome this morning. Good to see you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, folks, let me just give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm, my name again is Bob Jennings. I'm president of Tax Speaker. We're a national continuing education company for tax professionals. About a month and a half ago, I sent out a special newsletter regarding the uh, Corporate Transparency Act and the reporting requirements that go with it, just kind of bringing people up to date, particularly as a result of the uh, lawsuit that um, NSBA was involved in. And in that newsletter, I mentioned NSBA and their great involvement and how maybe it was going to help us in the future. So I also wanted to mention real quickly, and then we're going to open this up to Todd, I want to mention. So we sent that newsletter and about a day later, I get a call from NSBA essentially saying, who are you? <laughs> and we told them, and uh, here's our summary. I joined NSBA, tax speaker did. Uh, we don't get paid anything. We don't get a commission. We don't get a free product. NSB reached, the NSBA reached out to me and said, hey, how about we do something together, joint, free, nobody gets compensated for this, to bring people up to date. And I thought, what better source than the people who won the lawsuit? Um, if you're not familiar with it, Todd will bring us up. Uh, Todd, I'll fill in or, or ask questions whenever. But uh, Todd, could you, could you tell us a little first about NSBA and then bring us up on the lawsuit, please? Oh, sure thing. I appreciate it. I'm having, I, I, I'm trying to get my video to start. I'm not sure what my problem is here. So I apologize. You can't, you can't see me uh, live, but hopefully we can get that fixed here in a minute. Not but a yeah, problem. NSBA, National Small Business Association, we've been around for nearly 90 years now. We're actually the oldest national small business advocacy organization. And uh, that, that really is what, what we see as our job is trying to advocate for the small business community, primarily at the federal level. So we work on policy issues, access to capital, um, tax issues, um, uh, uh, labor issues, just whatever is affecting a broad cross-section of the small business community. Um, and this particular issue, we've been had on our, our, our radar for quite some time with the Congress has been talking about imposing all these reporting requirements on so-called beneficial ownership for, for at least a decade now. We've been tracking it. And it finally, of course, got passed into law in January of, of uh, 2021 uh, as part of a, a big defense authorization bill. Um, and uh, so you know, almost every member of Congress voted for it. Um, but, uh, uh, oh, here I am. Thankfully, I finally, it's running my video. Good to see you in person. <laughs> um, uh, but I think a lot of members of Congress didn't really understand what they were voting for at the time. It had very broad bipartisan support. Now we're seeing some people waking up and saying, well, hold on, maybe maybe we're not quite sure, so sure this is a good idea. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, while we've continued to work on repealing the legislation, we actually think it's unconstitutional. And so we actually filed a lawsuit in, in, in federal district court uh, back in 2022 uh, making those arguments, we think are quite strong arguments uh, that uh, for, for a number of constitutional reasons that these are these are powers left to the states. These are not powers the federal government has. Um, and uh, we won. Basically, the, the, the ruling came down March 1st, basically said there's no interstate commerce happening here. The formation of an entity, which is what you have to report on, is not interstate commerce many entities don't even engage in commerce in the traditional sense so the congress has no power to 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 um uh to regulate them to to force them to do reporting or any of the rest so um so we won on those grounds we think there are other reasons that it's unconstitutional um the congress has excuse me, not congress but the department of justice has now appealed that ruling um it's going to the to the 11th circuit uh, at the appellate level, we feel very confident in our, in our arguments at the at the appeals court level as well. Those uh, oral arguments will come up in September, and we hope to have a ruling fairly soon after that. Um, now, what does this mean practically, right? I mean, we won the lawsuit. A lot of people said, well, you won the lawsuit, it's dead. Unfortunately, when you win a lawsuit like this, it's the plaintiff that wins, right? So NSBA and our members currently don't have to comply with the with the corporate transparency act but everyone else does which in our view is is unacceptable and confusing uh 
right? So um, that, that state of play can't be sustained. We had hoped when we won the lawsuit that FinCEN, which is the enforcement agency at Treasury for all this reporting, um, would say, okay, let's suspend enforcement. Uh, we're not going to do anything until the legal issues get settled. That's not what they did. They basically said we're going to abide by the letter of the law and not enforce it on an SBA. So that's why this this appeal and the continuing through the court system is so important for the millions of small companies that unfortunately aren't members of an SBA right now. <laughs> so. A question for you. Yeah. Um, so after the lawsuit, of course, I talk about this. I gave a speech on it last week at a convention. Uh, but after the lawsuit, I joined NSBA, and the question that came up last week for the Hawaii Convention was, uh, well, Bob, you joined after the lawsuit. Uh, are you therefore protected? And even more importantly, whether you are or not, what about your clients? Todd, I've hit you cold. You got an answer for either of those? I, I do. Uh, the unfortunate answer is, is, is no. Only people who are members at the date of the ruling, which was March 1st, 2024, are actually covered. And to, and to complicate matters further, we're a trade association, right? So businesses join us. So a lot of business owners ha will have more than one entity. Even within a company, there might be yeah. more than one entity, as you know. Uh, well, only the entity that's a member is covered. So so you might, if you have four entities, you still would still have to report on the other three. That's why this is not an acceptable situation, even for our members, even for the people who are members as of March 1st. So while it's a big victory, and we, we expect it to be a complete victory by the end, right now we're in this sort of strange um, middle period where some of our members are exempt. Um, if we win at the appellate level, more people in those states will be exempt. The, the, the circuit court represents Florida, Georgia, Alabama. So companies, if we win there, will will be exempt. As, as, and then I expect this will go on to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, um, either everyone will, will get the whole thing overturned, which I actually expect, uh, or uh, uh, we'll lose. <laughs> and even, even our members won't be exempt. So we're in a strange middle period right now that's probably not going not gonna to last oh. long. And you said in September the appellate court is going to hear the uh, your your. That's right. Case. We've already made we've already made all the filings. Uh, the the government's made their arguments. We've made ours. There's been a number of of uh, amicus briefs that have been filed uh, on both sides. Many more of them and stronger ones on our side, and including there was a brief filed by uh, 21 different state attorneys general uh, on our side. Uh, uh, there weren't any attorneys general by the states that argued on the other side. Uh, so we feel really good about that. But all that, all the filings have been completed at this point. Uh, we're just waiting on the oral argument dates, which will be the last week of September. Um, and then the court will make a ruling, we hope, as soon as possible after that. It won't be immediate, but we hope before the end of the year. Because 2025, January 2025, is when um, uh, existing entities begin to have to report. Um, as you probably know, in 2024, only new and newly created entities have to report, and they have they have uh, a little bit of time after their formation. But they have to do it pretty soon after the formation of the entities. But folks who have been in business for a while have had entities for a while. They start January 1st of 2025. So so we're making the case for the court that there's there's some urgency here. Last year in our fall tax seminars, when I talked about this. I gave uh, this advice and I want to hear your comment on it. I said, look, the new people, I, you got a new business formed after 1231 and 23. You got 90 days, man. You got to file a form. Yep. An existing business, as I told everybody last year, and I'm still telling them now, is hold off. You don't have to file yet. Hold off till the, as long as you can to see where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. That's still reasonable guidance on both points, new that's, and existing. That's what we're telling people, especially our members who are in this strange spot of of of, of being members of ours. But we're, um, yeah, we urge people to you know, don't file before you have to. There's no reason to give the government information you don't need to give them. Uh, you don't know what you know, whether there's going to be a breach. Um, and things could change with all these because because now our lawsuit's not the only one. There's a whole series of other copycats, uh, so-called copycat suits that are out there now that have been filed since we won our case. Um, and so by the end of the year, there could very well be some rulings in other districts with other organizations. Um, and so I think folks need to wait uh, and see what the lay of the land is before they before they jump. 
Um, when I, know I was there have been this... a bunch of people who've already filed, but and, but okay. you, you can't retract it really. But but I but our advice is you should wait and not file until you really are required to. When I gave this speech last week at the convention, I was in Las Vegas at a casino, and uh, I gave them the list of people that have access to the boss, the database of mm -hmm. of all of this information. And uh, the very last line on my page shows the casinos now have access to it. Uh, for um, I suppose this all goes back to the very idea of money laundering. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's why they're doing this. They think this is going to help stop money laundering. And I'm deeply skeptical of that, as, as you know. Um, even today, there's there's a, a distinct lack of of awareness of this rule from the from the broad small business community it's going up but still a lot of small companies and company owners have no idea this is even a thing yet um and so this database that they think is going to help them figure out all these entities and who owns and who controls them is going to be you know quite incomplete even i think once it's fully implemented I, there are going to be millions of entities that, that have not filed that don't realize they're supposed to file um they're going to you know, so we have concerns about their liability, but it also means that uh, the database isn't going to be useful for law enforcement purposes the way they think it's going to be. Um, and also the criminals and the money launderers are going to be first in line to be the people who aren't going to file. Um, the, so the uh, penalties are beyond uh, horrendous. Um, the example that I, I use, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, we have a lady that owns 11 single family rental houses. Mm -hmm. Each one is in a single member LLC for liability protection, valid reason, got yeah. nothing to do with taxes. Yet she has to file all 11 forms or or the penalty kicks in, including a felony. And then as, as my example, when I was telling her this, I said, and if you change your address, or renew your driver's license or any of the other normal things, you got 30 days to tell them where the penalty kicks in. That's right. Uh, that's absolutely correct. And, um, you know, I often, when I'm talking to folks who are supportive of this rule, they say, well, the, the, the severest penalties are only for willful violations. You know, if you just had make an innocent mistake, you don't have to worry. But of course, a willful violation is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, the money launderer who doesn't report who's really controlling the company is also going to say, oh, oops, I didn't realize, I didn't do that on purpose. So I, I think they're going to they're gonna get more scrutiny than I think that people are suggesting. I think they're being a little bit disingenuous about that. So the penalties are significant, you know, two years in prison for, you know, you know, not filing this form with Vincent on a, on a, on a legal business that's not committing any crimes is possible, which is crazy. <laughs> what, uh, what else is NSBA trying to do legislatively uh, beyond uh, the Corporate Transparency Act? I mean, this disaster is honest. You're working on it. Thank you, by the way. Uh, what else we got going on out there? What's being well, done? Well, well, on this particular front, we're working on the on the on the judicial front, obviously, and making some real progress. But in the meantime, we're not sure the courts are going to rule and get all this resolved before the vast majority of companies are going to have to begin to comply with the rule. So we've really been trying to make sure, see, see if we can at least get a delay out of Congress. And there was a bill we got helped get passed at the end of 2023 by the House that passed almost unanimously on a bipartisan basis to, to basically put in a one-year delay of implementation. So that it'll give time for the legal issues to get resolved, see where we are. We think that makes a great deal of sense. Um, so we've, we've been supportive of that. We need to get the Senate to pass it. I think there's broad support in the Senate, but as you probably all know, even for things there's broad support, there's always somebody who wants to hold it up and they want to get something else for their support in the Senate. You know, one Senator often can hold things up, uh, for, for an interminable amount of time. So, uh, yeah, that, that's that's the main thing we're working on right now. Of course, there's also legislation to repeal it entirely, which, we're, of course, we're supportive of. We think we're not – obviously, we're not in favor of money launderers or money laundering. That's not who we represent. We represent small businesses across the country, legitimate, real companies. Um, but we just don't think this is the way to do it. They're not going to capture money launderers this way, they're, and they're going to wind up catching a whole bunch of innocent small businesses in this in this dragnet. It really is a dragnet in the in – the, strict sense of the term uh so we need to get rid of it and think about it a different way probably through the financial system and not through entity formation uh to uh 
to get at this issue. So that's the main things we're working on. But, but, but we're, we have a whole bunch of other set of issues if you want to chat about those too that we, we can talk about. But if folks want to be helpful in this right now, obviously there's a limited amount that people can do in the judicial system, unless they want to file an because brief in some of these cases that are floating around out there, of course. But on the legislative side, they absolutely should contact their senators, especially, and tell them that uh, 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 we support a, a, a delay. They should support a delay. It should be a bipartisan no-brainer just to give time for the legal issues to get resolved. Uh, and, and, and that should be something that I think they should get a receptive audience for, and people could really get uh, uh, involved in that, I think. Does NS NSBA's website have a uh, uh, something that will – we can go to and it'll get out to our senators and, and, our... Do. and we have and, and it's available to non-members as well you can go to our site it's nsba.biz um, and if you go to the action center you should see it up there on the bar there's a there's a sort of a pre-made alert or a letter you can send to, to to your senators that basically outlines that you can send a letter to on regarding full repeal or or the one-year delay you know, in all candor, well, we would love a repeal. It's the one-year delay that actually has the possibility of, of happening in the near okay. term. So that, I would focus people on that. One of the big things that maybe uh, NSBA hasn't seen, but we accountants are seeing, is um, the clients want us to fill these out. The attorney's uh, yeah. not too interested. Um, so the question has been uh, across the country, can an accountant fill this out and be considered practicing law without a license? And the latest answer we have is fairly straightforward and that is uh as of today 54 different states and uh, associations uh no bar association has come out and said you can't do this uh, in fact uh, maryland about a week and a half ago their bar association said accountants can do it and both uh, to my knowledge both cameco and aon our largest liability insurers have both said you're covered if you as an accountant fill this out. I'm not proposing fill it out. I just wanted to answer a yeah. question that I get that's, everywhere. Yeah, that's a really good point. We have heard from a number of accounting companies that they're hearing from their insurance companies that they shouldn't get involved in this. Um, I tend to think, I mean, I'm not involved in that side of the business, but I tend to think that's mostly about maybe giving advice on how to fill out the form, not <coughs> actually doing it. Um, Cause I think a lot of companies want to know well, what is a beneficial owner? Um, that's that's a distinct gray area. So I think a lot of even lawyers are reluctant to advise companies on what that is and just refer them to the 50 or 60 page FAQ that Vincent has issued to determine what a beneficial owner is. Um, and that, that's actually worth talking about, too, because it comes down to whether there's an individual that exerts substantial control, so-called, uh, over the uh, some aspects of the business well that could in a small company that could be virtually every employee yeah um and it could also be some outside consultants um uh that they look to to you know if a small company fully outsources their it function well that company slash person uh is definitely exerting substantial control over a, a significant uh, portion of the business uh so do you have to file uh for those folks as well it's it's a gray area for lots of companies if you get advice that you follow regularly from you know your dad that used to be in business uh <laughs> is he a beneficial owner i mean it's it because i think people understand that the the definition here is not just do you own a certain share of the company you don't have to own any of the company uh if you if you exert substantial control over some aspect of it so um, a lot of folks just don't know who to file. And that's what's, I think, giving a lot of professional advisors um, heartache is they don't know what to tell people about this. And they don't want to be liable for giving the wrong advice, which I completely um, understand. I know you've got some, I, I want to ask you about some additional topics. I didn't say it at the beginning. I'll say it now. We are going to try to address some questions here at the end, uh, but I wanted to get through everything. Um, you guys are maintaining a frequently answered question link on NSBA's website. Yeah. Anything in there particularly that you can bring up that we ought to know about? I've hitched cold. I know. Well, I, actually, I think it is. It is. It is the substantial control piece that I think people need to know about. 
um, because we often get questions. People they they go to the Finson website and they say, "Well, this looked quite straightforward." I mean, I you know I'm the owner of the business and I know my driver's license number and I know my address and I can fill out the form. What's the big deal? I mean, I get that and I understand. I, I understand there there could be companies and entities for whom they have to report on one person and that person's doing the reporting and they're in and out. They're done, um, and their only concern is sort of the security of the information and having to do it at all and what if they forget to update it one year and they might have a penalty it's, all those concerns exist but in terms of the difficulty of it they say it's not that big a deal got it but what they're not thinking about is it's not just about who owns you know half or even 20 percent of the company it's it's about thinking about all these other issues uh, about who who may be exerting control in your business who who are your uh, advisors, outside consultants. Um, I mean, even the judge in our case, we, when we were at the federal district court level, um, th th this is this is the issue that that, that he really questioned the Department of Justice about, because he said, "Look, I used to be in a small law firm. There were there were fewer than twenty of us in the firm, and you know, everybody in the law firm and it, it exerted substantial control." over some part of the company. And I said, if, if, if I were still in business, I would I would report on every single one of those individuals uh, just to be safe. Um, and so his point was that we're, we're talking about whether the law is unconstitutionally vague, because of course that is a thing. You, if, a law, if, if, if a person who's supposed to comply with the law can't understand what they're supposed to do, the law is unconstitutional. Um, and that was what we were talking about. And that's that, that certainly caught at least that judges uh, I. To carry the accountant analogy just a touch further, uh, I've had people ask, Bob, are you going to do it? I am still a practicing CPA. And my response is, I don't mind doing the form, but the risk that I would entail keeps me from doing it. And then the common second question is, why? And I said, let me give you an example. So I have a drugstore that's got four owners and about 15 employees. And, and admittedly, don't you think the non-owner pharmacist exerts control over there? Because I do. And I said, if I as the accountant fill it out, I'm like you, Todd, I'm going to uh, say everybody here, we're going to report, but let's go a step further. I am required to report any change within 30 right. days of occurring. Does that mean I have to ask every employee every month, hey, did you move? Did your driver's license change? Did right. you this? I don't want that responsibility. Right. But that is what it means, practically. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, bo bo before we go to questions, do you have something, anything else that you wanted to mention that I didn't bring up? Well, I think I think we have we we've kind of covered a, a, a lot of ground here in a little short amount of time. So I can't think of anything, but I'm, I bet people have a, a lot of questions of things that you and I didn't think about that we should have been talking about. <laughs> so, um, Jason, do you want me to get them off the screen or do you guys want to pass them along to us? I can get them off the screen. Okay. If the company closed, this is from Melanie just uh, at the very beginning. The company closed in 23 or 24. Does the company need to still need to file a BOA? They closed in 23. No, if they closed in 24, yes. Would you agree with that, Todd? Well, probably so. It depends on if it's a new entity, right? Because because the existing entities don't have to start reporting until 2025. So if it's an existing entity before January 1st of 2024, uh, and and they've dissolved, um, my guess is there wouldn't be a reporting requirement. Uh, Brian at the beginning uh, said, so everyone should join S NSBA. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that, although I'm sure Todd would be happy to we, say yes. I mean, we would love it. I, I just don't want to mislead people in thinking that's going to get you out from under all this stuff at this point. Um, I mean, it could. Things can change. Well, who knows? We might win in the next round and uh, and the and the date of, of – uh, um, membership gets re up to the new uh, ruling at time. Uh, but I would, you know, if people are members, they're going to get regular updates from us on, on what's happening in this field and, and lots of other small business issues. And of course, membership gives us the kind of support we need to continue to pursue this in an aggressive way. So we we would love it if people would join. I just don't want to mislead people into thinking it'll, it'll sort of, it's a, it's a get out of jail free card at this point. Okay, well, 
we got we got a bunch more. Here comes uh, Larry Pond, and Larry is one of our speakers, and he says, uh, guys, New York State passed their own version of the CTA called the uh, LLC Transparency Act. Mm-hmm. The biggest difference, and this is huge, the reporting is public. Uh, are you going to be suing the state of New York? Well, not on these grounds. We we, we have we, we that I am concerned about that, uh, but part of our the grounds of our lawsuit is this is not is that it this should be left up to the states right because because historically and constitutionally these are areas that have been the sole jurisdiction of the states and these are not powers that are enumerated to the federal government or to congress um so it's it's a more it's a trickier question and so uh just because we disagree with what a uh, entity is doing doesn't necessarily mean that there's a legal basis to challenge it. Uh, it might be more of a of a legislative and political fight than a than a legal fight. Okay, uh, Todd, this one's for you. It says uh, from Lynn, "Are you surprised to hear that the legal community is touting the fact that they believe BOI is not unconstitutional and that you will not prevail in the end?" I hope you do, but this is what I'm hearing from the attorneys. Well, I, we've been hearing that from the beginning. Um, uh, they didn't think we'd win at the district court level, and and we did. Um, uh, we're we've you know you can go and see the the briefs in the in the appeals court level. I, I I'm quite confident. I think we have the stronger case, the upper hand. I I genuinely think. I mean, I'm not an attorney myself, to be clear, uh, but we have some excellent ones, and I, I I'm quite optimistic that we're going to win at the next level too. Uh, Meryl, I'm going to extend your question a little bit. She says, if someone joins between now and the oral arguments in September, Mm -hmm. will they be covered under the new ruling or do they need to live in the particular states? Um, So I guess we're talking about if we join now and you win at the appellate level, will we be protected? My, My understanding is that if we win, then what's likely to be the case, and again, I, I, we can't prejudge how this ruling is going to be written. But it seems likely that people who live in those states and members of NSBA at that point will be will be exempt. A couple of people are saying, I thought that uh, existing businesses had to file by 1231 of 24. Yes. Um, and you had mentioned oh, 1231. No. Yeah. Well, January 1st of 25 technically is the is the beginning of the reporting period for. OK, so an existing business. Do they need if uh, if I was in business in 2020, for example, and still in business today? Uh, when do I need to file this form? By I guess is the question. I was under the impression it had to be filed by 1231 or 24 myself as well. Uh, yeah, but you have 30 days, so you um, uh, from the beginning of the enactment, so you would have until the end of January of 2025, I believe. Okay, thank you for the clarity. All right, let's uh, Bill, you can't unring even if required. Um, <laughs> Yeah, nothing I can do. Can you please talk about who the FFIEC is planning on making this database available to? Uh, I have a slide on it. Do you want me to address it? I can just give the sure, list. It's, it's scary. Uh, federal, yeah, I, state, and local law enforcement, security, and intelligence, federal, state, and local, and tribal, uh, judges, prosecutors, financial institutions, and their regulators anywhere in the world, U.S. Treasury. And here's where it starts getting a little bothersome to me. Foreign law and law enforcement judges and prosecutors, that's mm-hmm. foreign law enforcement judges and prosecutors, casinos and money service businesses. That's just Bob's short list. You got anybody you want to right. add to that one, Todd? I think that's, that's, I can't think of anybody you didn't cover. But of course, um, and so at that point, it doesn't matter how strong the data security is for FinCEN at Treasury, right? Then all that matters is how strong the data security is for anybody that got access to the information. Then, so even if the if the you know the foreign source, uh, the foreign law enforcement who gets the information has good intentions and they're not doing it for malicious reasons, suddenly it's in their hands, and who knows who's going to get uh, their hands on it now? So, so yeah, there's lots of concerns about that. Is a company that closed down in December of 23 required to file the BOI form? Not to I my knowledge, I no. don't think so, no. No. Uh, Myron- I, think, I think the key thing to think about here, though, when you say the company closed down, 
what's important to remember is that the reporting is about entities. Yeah. Right. So it could be the entity still exists, even though it's not making money, it's not operating as an ongoing business. My understanding is that wouldn't matter if the, if you if you if you continue to maintain the entity, um, uh, and it's filing at the state level, you would still need to report, even if you're not an active business. And what we have told people is the days of you just letting a company die die because of non-filing the annual report. No, you have to file whatever is required to, to dissolve yeah. at the state level by the end of 2023. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, people having trouble filing the report uh, locally because of electronic issues. Um, I haven't heard any other issues. I did at the very beginning. Uh, are you hearing any reporting issues? Are you getting anything on that? I have actually not heard that. Um, I mean, there's some folks who 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 found it difficult and complex, but I haven't had an inability to file yet. Okay, uh, a couple of comments on insurance. Uh, their insurance company saying they won't cover it. Uh, I can't address that. All I can tell you is the nation's two largest liability carriers, uh, both Cigna and Aon, Chemical and Aon. Uh, the largest liability carriers for accountants have both come out and said they will cover uh, the preparation of this report. Um, let's see, is the BOI requirement to file driven by the entity uh, or by the signers? And it seems like the filing requirement is driven by the entity, isn't it, rather than the signers? Sort of, but it ultimately is this is the is the the sign or the person who sh who is should have been considered a beneficial owner who will ultimately bear penalties right so if if uh you have if you're a person who should have been filing and you weren't uh then you're the one that ultimately could go to jail i mean the entity can't go to jail yeah um one of the questions is something we didn't talk about you can get you anyone can get what's called a unique identifier yes where you go to fincen you get your own identifier you provide the information mm -hmm. once and then on forms you fill out you just give them that identifier does that eliminate the requirement to update the change of address and driver's license renewals uh, my gut feel and, and correct me please is if you've got the unique identifier all you need to do is update the unique identifier rather than all the other forms any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, you still have to update the, the basic information, but but you can use the identifier to sort of really uh, simplify the process. So I, I would, if this gets finalized, we're moving forward and everyone has to comply, I think the the, the, the fence and identifier number is something that people should, uh, should apply for and get. It'll simplify the process. Community property state question, what about the non-owner spouses? I'll give you a real good answer. If you're not sure, when in doubt, fill it out is my answer. The penalties right. are too severe. Again, correction if you've got one on that. And I will tell you, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And that's something else we didn't really talk about is that companies think about is, you know, if if there's, you know, some issue where they're being looked at legally for some reason, I mean, this will be one of those things that if if law enforcement, you know, doesn't find anything on the thing they're initially looking for in your business, they're going to check and see if you filed your your beneficial ownership uh, paperwork through the CTA. Uh, and they're going to think about, have you filed for the right people? Because there's significant penalties. And, and, and they will be able to use this to, to hold over the head of a lot of companies uh, for something else entirely. Um, so that's, I, it really is important, I think, that people make sure that they check all these boxes and do it the right way if this if this it gets finalized because uh, it could it could play into some entirely different issue edwin says i've been receiving an insurmountable amount of client requests to complete the boi i know edwin he's a cpa in seattle uh would simply sitting down with the client as they fill it out be considered uh practice liability related uh, I, I can't answer that. I, I don't I know. If you... I, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I, I, Edwin, we don't want to touch that. <laughs> okay. Uh, does the law apply to officers of private foundations? I know most charities are exempt, but I'm not real sure on this one. 
I, I'm uh, not positive either. I have to go back and look and, and get an answer. But there, there's a if they, they go to fence office, there's a list of of exempted entities, and so that's another thing that companies need to do. They have to go, go through and make see if perhaps they are exempted because there are a number of kinds of companies that are that are exempted sizes of companies as well. I mean, so if you're if you're above a certain size, you don't have to worry about all this. The big guys are are out. Okay, Joanna asks a question I wanted to bring up earlier, but I'm going to bring it up now. Um, our office is in Indiana, but my CPA firm is down in Florida. Florida has a lot of HOAs, a lot of HOAs. Yeah. And the yeah. question is, are HOAs exempt? And the answer is, no, they're not. Yeah, it's actually, they're, they're actually one of the entities that are, that are the most upset about this because they have a lot of, yeah, it's going to be really difficult for them. The uh, answer that I had are the HOA. I'm a treasurer of an HOA. There are six houses in this HOA. I've gone because all six people are members of the board, which to me exerts influence. And two of them have said, I'm not giving you that stuff. So now what do I do? I don't have an answer. But yeah, HOAs have to file. Um, Timothy, here you go, right down your alley, Todd. What other NSBA benefits would benefit me? Why should I join? Uh, why did Bob join? Bob joins because I recognize uh, strength is in membership, and I join not because I'll have any bigger voice than anybody else, but the more people that join, the better it is. And again, I don't get a discount, a commission, a free product. I am no different than anybody else. I join because I recognize the strength of membership. Yeah, we appreciate it. And, and that is that is most of it, honestly. Uh, we do have a number of, I think, really good benefits, you know, discounts on laptop computers through Dell and this and that, that I think are, would benefit a lot of companies. Um, uh, but I think our probably our biggest benefit is the information that you receive. We, we report regularly on not just what's happening in this, but a whole host of issues that small companies face in, in Washington that, that I think people find really useful. Um, I remember back in the in the days of the pandemic, we were front and center on the PPP. We had information on how that was happening and when and how before almost anybody did, and that was extremely useful for for our members, advisors to our members, uh, and uh, uh, so that kind of thing. I think I think would be a, a great benefit, and 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 just knowing that you're supporting you know the work that we do, trying to promote the needs of small companies up here, I think is. Um, uh, what a lot of members get out of it. Uh, clarification, I'll answer it. If existing business closes in 24, does it need to file? Yes, it does need to file. Um, even, here's another one, that, uh, I'll leave this for you, Todd, and if we run out of time, just tell me. Um, even if the current date of ruling was the limitation for existing members, would you recommend more join NSBA as a potential future court case ruling date? I bet I know the answer, but I'll let you answer. Well, I mean, again, I, I don't want to mislead people into, into thinking this is, would be an easy out. We don't know what the ruling is going to look like, but uh, there, uh, if we have a ruling you know, late in the year, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm optimistic we'll win, and, I, and, I, and we, they could very well update that date for when you need to be a member to be covered at that point. So people who joined since March 1st would suddenly be exempted uh, pending further action by the Supreme Court. Um, even if we go to the Supreme Court, and we expect we will uh, at some point, it, it, we might not have that uh, in front of us until even 2026. So so okay. knowing that you have an exemption for that period of time could, could, could be useful. I'm not guaranteeing that. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it is possible. Okay. Uh, Tim wants to know, has Pennsylvania passed a law that all entities must report? Have you heard anything, Todd, about Pennsylvania passing a law on this? I, I can't specifically speak to Pennsylvania, but I think I did hear something like that, but I can't speak to the details. Okay. Now, Leslie raises a question that I think is an excellent one. Um, I believe that I read that uh, FinCEN came out and said an accountant is not going to generally be considered a person of influence or uh, um, something along that line. Now, I argue with that because they... The people at FinCEN, in my opinion, have no clue what small firms do and small accountants do. And my response, I, I let myself get angry on it. I said, look, it is extremely common for a client to call and say, Bob, I need a new bookkeeper. Could you tell me which one that I should hire? Tell me how I haven't crossed over a boundary when I answer that question. Uh, and then Leslie says, if the accounting firm is considered beneficial, which I think I can make a case that it could be, 
should just the firm be listed or do we need to list every employee of the accounting firm as a uh, influential party of beneficial ownership interest? Uh, I don't have an answer to that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I would tend to think it would be the individuals who are working for the firm. Uh, you know, whoever, whoever you're is serving the client is probably whoever's the specific person is giving that advice uh, could be the one who, would, who could be considered a beneficial owner. Um, but I think you're exactly right. I think FinCEN, that's one of the problems we face. Of course, FinCEN has never dealt with the small business community before. I mean, they are a, a, a financial crimes enforcement thing. They deal with banks. They deal with, with international money laundering, funding of terrorism. That's what they do. They've had no experience in the small business community at all. So they haven't begun to understand how to I reach out to the small business community. They don't know how small businesses function. And yeah, I, I would bet dollars to donuts that the person who, who answers that question thinks the CPA firm is just somebody who delivers financial reports Yeah, um, and gives you, you know, here's what your balance sheet looks like and walks away. And as you know, that is not the relationship that, that many or even most small companies have with their CPAs. There are important advisors in the business to them in many cases for just for the reasons you say. Shauna wants to know how tough are they going to be with penalties for a new company formed in 2024 who don't file within 90 days just because they don't know about the requirement. I think I read something about they are going to be a little lenient on that comment, Todd. They say that, I, I you know, one doesn't know, right? Because uh, if, if your business is suspect for some reason, maybe totally unrelated to, to the uh, to this particular law, uh, the fact of your lack of filing or incorrect filing, uh, you know, they might find all kinds of reasons not to be lenient uh, about it. I knew we'd get some questions. I didn't know the answer. And it's a great question because it, it's so good. It's a real life issue. Nobody is considered at FinCEN. So I have a nonprofit corporation that forms with the Secretary of State during 2024. Nonprofits are generally exempt, but they don't get the federal tax exempt status until after 90 days has passed, which is very common. They're legally formed, but it takes six months to be approved as a nonprofit. Are they required to file the BOI? Uh, my answer is great question. I don't know. And I don't think anybody does. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it's definitely a gray area. I mean, if, if it were me, I would probably file until I got the, the nonprofit letter, but definitely a judgment call the next one is uh we're gonna have to be careful with the upcoming elections what are the chances of getting legislative remedies enacted this year uh legislatively i'll leave that to you my gut is I, there anything gonna pass it, it's hard but i but i but given the fact the house has already overwhelmingly passed a delay with with i think there was a one dissenting vote so virtually every republican and democrat voted for the delay in the house um and there was broad support for it in the Senate. I, I think uh, we could we could do something uh, in the Senate this year if they pass the same bill that the House passed, uh, and we could get the delay. I think I'm not I'm not going to say I think it's probably going to happen, but I think there's a real uh, real chance of it happening. Uh, Emily says, "What would you advise a small corporation that became a corporation in 24 to do?" Uh, file within 90 days. I mean, that yeah. that was a clear cut answer. Yeah. Uh, Todd, I hate to tell you, we got about 30 more. <laughs> uh, they are rolling. Well, we got 500 people taking this video. Yeah, that's uh, um, yeah. Many of my clients have not complied because of all the rules and confusion surrounding the law. They've already missed the original 40, uh, 90 day mark. Do you think they'll be subject to penalty even if they complied late? Uh, my gut, again, I'm, I may be overridden, is I think they're going to have to be lenient this year. They're going to have to be. You agree on that, Todd? I, I do. I, I, I think if people are late just, and, and that are required to file, go ahead and do it. I don't think there's going to be a substantial issue there. Um, but we don't know yet. This is still very new, untilled soil. Okay. Uh, Caitlin is saying FinCEN.gov, quote, a reporting company created or registered to do business before 1-1 of 24 will have until 1-1 of 25 to file its initial beneficial ownership information report. 
That's technically correct, but as Todd mentioned, you actually have a 30-day grace period after that. So you get it till the end of January of 25 for existing companies before yeah. 24. Okay. Uh, September 24 ruling, which has not happened yet. Uh, does this only apply to the NSBA members or to the nation as a whole? Well, there's been no ruling, but let's say in September they rule again in your favor, in NSBA's favor. I'm going to restate that. They rule in small businesses' favor. Uh, what do you think? You think there's a chance that'll be extended to the nation or just to members of NSBA? Uh, I th- I don't think the court ruling is likely to extend to the nation. I think the, 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 the appellate court has that authority in this kind of a case. But I would hope that if at that point suddenly several states are exempt and members of NSBA are exempt, that FinCEN would of their own volition say, let's 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 hit the pause button until we get this figured out. If that doesn't happen, then there's even more um, fodder to, to to urge Congress to do that for them. Uh, are you surprised this isn't more in the news cycle? Seems like small business owners who are affected would be more vocal with their legislators. Uh, I will tell you from personal experience, I'm loud. We speak in all 50 states, 20,000 customers, and my letters are ignored just like everyone else's. Uh, I even know personally our Senator Todd Young, uh, and I'm not very pleased with that office because they don't respond to me either. Now, at that point, I'll get off of my uh, editorial comment. You got anything you want to say there? Well, I I, I wish it were being covered more. I, I will say that it felt a little bit like shouting into the wind. Um, but then when the ruling came down for us March 1st, we did get a lot of attention, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the first few weeks following the ruling, more than we had before. So I do think that's helped to increase awareness in the small business community that this is a thing, um, the thing to pay attention to, and that I think in turn has, has, has caused them to start talking to their members of Congress. We would go up to the Hill and have meetings with, with members of Congress and their staff. They would know what we're talking about. Uh, and now they are beginning to hear from constituents. There is an awareness of this thing now, which is which is half the battle, I got to say. Um, okay. So so I do think we're making some progress. Uh, Terry wants to know, and I think this must be a misprint. I've heard the average age of a responsible party for a U.S. business is 238 years old. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you mean 23, 28, or 38. Uh, I don't know. Uh, one of the reasons allegedly was to come into compliance with international law. What be what would be an acceptable solution in the eyes of NSBA to meet these two goals? I, I, let's pass on the first one. I, I don't know what the average age is. What do you think about the international law thing? Well, that that often has been cited uh, as a as as a reason that, that other countries have a, a lot more transparency about who controls owns every entity in the country. You know, that hasn't been our system. Uh, they don't have a federal system like we have. We're just a different kind of country than they are. Um, and so I, what you got to remember is there's there's two different parties here arguing on this. There's folks who are just about transparency, and they think that anybody that has a company, anybody should be able to go back and see who they are, see who owns it, find out where they live, know everything about them. Uh, that's just what they believe this system sh- should be like. And so they've been supportive of this, even though tra- that kind of transparency isn't actually the goal of the CTA. But they've still been supporting it as a, as a first step to get us there. So there's that whole crowd that's out there. But then you have the, the sort of the money laundering arguments. And that really is what Congress, you know, uh, bought into when they agreed to this and passed this was that it was an important thing to stop money laundering. Um, but uh, it's hard to look at this and think that it's going to be effective. I mean, the only thing that could be effective here is if they have somebody they think is a money launderer and they haven't filed their beneficial ownership form correctly, or they haven't reported on the right people, it gives them another legal hook to go after them. Um, But it's not going to allow them as far as I can see to find out who those people are. The way you're going to find out who's doing money laundering and where the companies are is through the financial system. You got to follow the money, not the entity. And so uh, one of the reasons that we have this system is because for years now, we've had this requirement on banks to do customer due diligence and know your customer rules. And those are also a pain, but 
it, in, the banks are the ones that are in the middle of these financial transactions. They can see if something odd is happening and they're supposed to know who their customers are. And sort of making some changes to that system seems like it would be far more effective at actually ending money laundering than just creating a database of, of entity owners um, in the United States. So that's where we think we should, we, we should look. And I gotta say, we have this rule now precisely because the banks <laughs> uh don't like those cdd rules and those know your customer rules and i understand why but they uh actually they lobbied for the corporate transparency act a few years ago precisely because they thought that was the path to get them out from under their reporting requirements right now so they actually were lobbying for it and there's actually a provision of the law that got passed that says once this is implemented FinCEN should go back and see if they can reduce the uh the the regulations and the, and the rules on banks uh and get them out from under some of that i don't think that's going to happen what's going to happen is both are going to be fully in effect and then the, i think the bank's gamble isn't likely to succeed but really that's why we have this rule because the big banks pushed for it and basically wanted to throw small business under the bus so they could get out from some of their own liabilities totally unrelated yet directly related to nsba we do a one hour class on Nexus and we talk about the disastrous effect the Wayfair uh, holding against South Dakota had on small business several years ago. Mm -hmm. And this question is from uh, Kenna who says, what is NSBA's stance on sales tax a la the Wayfair case? And he, I don't, it's out of the blue there, Todd. Yeah, a, a little bit. We haven't actually dealt with that for a bit. So I'm not, I'm not might not be able to give a fully lucid answer, but it, it's 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 been difficult. But we've we've supported a rule that if you can sort of exempt some level of of transactions for small companies, um, you know, we're willing to buy into a system where people can pay to various state levels. But uh, we don't want to create a burden where every small business that sells any little thing to another state is has significant liability because the bur the administrative burden is just is just too great. But um, okay. Several people are saying, uh, why doesn't, uh, why don't they just get this information from already existing information from the state websites, the attorneys general, the driver's license, whatever. I've wondered the same thing. Any comment there on, on that? Well, it, the part of it is every state is different. Um, so even if they said, hey, states, you're required to give us this, the, the federal government, this information, um, not every state requires for you to form an entity or to maintain an entity that you give the kind of information that FinCEN wants. I mean, you're not necessarily having to report on every beneficial owner and their driver's license number with the Secretary of State. Um, so they don't necessarily have the information that, that FinCEN wants them to, 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 to send in. Are you willing, Todd, to give your opinion on whether you think the filing requirements will hold through year end? Unchanged, I guess, is what they're saying. Uh, you mean do you, if, uh, the requirement? Or, to um, I, I, you know, I don't know. It, it would just it, honestly, it just be a, a guess and an opinion about you know, one or two things are going to happen. Either we're going to see some further legal action that will be in our favor, or Congress will take some action. Um, I, I mean, I think for now, companies should should assume it's going to be in effect on 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 January first, and they should be prepared to file. Uh, but I don't think they should file before them. We are about out of time. I'm going to answer these next two as I, they are good questions to summarize. Um, and then I'll let you, of course, throw in. Uh, what do we do for clients who started their business early in 2024? Nothing yet has been done. File a form. And if it's late, you know, I, I still think you need to file the form ASAP um, for a new business in 2024. The other one. Can you please again discuss the due date for an entity entity that has been in business well before 24? Is the first report due 1 1 of 25 or 1231 of 24? And my answer is technically it is due 1 1 of 25. Right. You get a 30 day grace period where you would be late, but you're still okay. That's correct as well, right. isn't it? Yep. Okay, uh, folks, we have uh, exceeded the allotted time here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to ask Todd for any last comments, and then we're going to sign off. So, Todd, you got anything to add to this? 
Uh, well, not a lot. We've heard a lot of ground, but I really appreciate the time. It's good to talk to you all. Um, uh, you know, if you have any other questions or comments, uh, please feel free to come to our website, which I mentioned before is nsba.biz, B-I-Z. Um, and we have a whole section dedicated to the Corporate Transparency Act and FAQ and all that. Um, and as I think, Bob, you mentioned before, we have, a, we have an action center. So if you or your clients want to go there and just sort of tell members of Congress what you think, there's sort of some already prepared stuff that I think is really helpful there. So I'd encourage people to do that uh, as well. Um, so I, I want to thank you for the time. I want to thank you for the support. Thanks for being a member. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I hope we can continue to have this dialogue. And if we can have, if we have an update later in the year, we want to go back and do something like this again. I'm happy to do it. Well, Todd, I want to thank you for taking an hour out of your time. Uh, and you folks online, thank you for listening for an hour. And again, we did this just as a courtesy, a service to small business. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in. And we will maybe give you an update uh, maybe in September after okay. the appellate court hearing. We'll try to do this again. Great. We appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. See you again. Bye.